Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kaufman, I'm the Nerd in the Street, and today we are unboxing the Audio Engine A2 Plus desktop speakers. All right, everyone, we are here with another consumer electronics video. I haven't done one of these in a while. I was recently in the market for a pair of speakers to sit on my desk. Now, normally when I'm sitting here at my desk, I'm using headphones if I need to hear anything at all. I've got a pair of Audio-Technica ATH-M50X headphones. I've had them for years. I unboxed them in a video. And those headphones are still working perfectly fine, and I'm still normally going to be using headphones. However, recently a new consideration came to light, and that is sometimes I want to be able to have other people sitting here at my desk with me and I want to be able to watch things with them Show them things on the computer. We're talking simple stuff, you know, YouTube, Netflix, video games But I want to be able to have those things on the computer and have both of us be able to hear them Without each having to wear an individual pair of headphones that would prevent us from talking to each other at the same time So I went online to look for a pair of speakers and it was an interesting process Really kind of a stressful drawn-out process. The first thing I did was just go to Logitech.com and see what they had available. But I figured I could do better than Logitech, and I remembered from a couple of years ago that there's a speaker system called the Harman Kardon Sound Sticks that I thought looked really cool. Now, the Sound Sticks are created by the same company who manufactured the Apple Pro speakers, and if you saw my videos about unboxing that iMac G4 in my apartment a couple of years ago, I ended up using that iMac G4 as a jukebox, and I really liked those Apple Pro speakers. They were just a couple of very small desktop speakers that I had in my kitchen at the time, they looked great, they worked great, and so the Harman Kardon sound sticks, I thought they would be perfect. It's by the same company, they're a little bit higher end than the Apple Pro speakers originally were. So I looked those up. And the sound sticks are currently on their fourth iteration, and I ran into several problems that ended up making me think maybe the sound sticks weren't the perfect solution for me for this setup at this time. The sound sticks 3 looked very similar to the first version and the second version, and to those Apple Pro speakers. They are clear speakers, they've got clear plastic, and you can see the speaker cones and the wiring all just perfectly transparently. So it's a pretty cool and unique look, I think. Um, now the Sound Sticks 4, which is the only version that Harman Kardon is currently selling, the white version of those, to me, just look like a knockoff of the 3s. They don't look nearly as good, in my opinion. There is also a black version of the Sound Sticks 4. I think those actually look okay. I do think they look maybe a little dated. They kind of look like speakers for a home theater system from the late 2000s, like 2008 sort of vibe that I get from those. But they do look better, and if the black version of the Soundstick 4s were currently being sold in the United States, I probably would have ordered those. However, Harman Kardon, for some reason, is only selling the white version in the US. They do sell the black version up in Canada, and I know some people in Canada, so I thought about ordering from a retailer, shipping it to someone there, and having them send it across the border to me. Of course, once you start getting into that, now I'm paying currency exchange fees, I'm paying international shipping. I'm complicating the warranty if I ever were to need it and adding just all kinds of little complications and expenses that I don't necessarily need. I did go on eBay and look at the Soundstick 3s. Some people are still selling those and you can get them sort of like new or open box. I bid on one. I made an offer for another. I wasn't able to actually acquire any from eBay without paying what I feel is a not smart amount over the cost that they initially were. The cheapest I was able to find them that I could have gotten them on eBay was was about $40 or $50 more than Harman Kardon was actually selling them for when they were new. So I didn't want to pay a markup for an older product. The Soundstick 3s were around for like a decade, and you know, the rubber and plastic can sometimes degrade just over time with those kinds of products. So I thought maybe I could do something other than the Soundsticks. Um, I also wasn't 100% sure that the aesthetic would match this particular setup. They look great with Macs, but you know, I don't have a Mac. And the Soundstick 3s, because the subwoofer is sort of open on the top. I was also concerned about dust getting into them, into the subwoofer, and also I saw another YouTuber who did a video about the Soundstick 3s, and he showed a close-up shot of the base, the rubber base, um, sort of a rubber ring that the speaker sits on, um, and I really appreciated that he pointed this out. He showed a close-up shot to demonstrate that dust really 
sticks to those rubber rings that the Soundstick 3s sat on as well. Um, and currently my computer setup is back in my bedroom, which is something I hoped I would never have to do again after I moved out. Once I was working full time, you know, moved out into my own place, um, I separated my office and my bedroom out. They're currently back together because of the living situation I'm currently in. And that basically means there's a lot of dust in this room. I've had to, you know, dust out my computer a couple times already, and I very rarely had to do that when I was in an apartment. Uh, when you've got a computer in the same room as a bed, the dust, you know, from dead skin cells and dead hair on the bed, it turns into dust, it floats over to the computer space, and I really just had a feeling that the Soundstick 3s would have been a pain in the butt to keep looking nice, even if I did get them. Even though they look cool, they would have been maybe maintenance to keep looking well. So anyway, I went online, I started looking at other options. One of the first options I found were the Audio Engine A2 Pluses. This is a pair of speakers, I'm gonna unbox them in just a moment because this intro is already very long. But I wanted to mention, because I might get some comments on this video, I made the mistake of looking at basically some audiophile forums online. People who are very, very into getting really good quality speakers. And the thing about audiophiles that I have uh, determined over the past couple of weeks of looking for speakers is that they will always tell you whatever you're looking at is crap. It's terrible. But if you spend twice as much money and get something twice as big, it will be perfect. Now that seems pretty simple, but the problem is if you go and then consider that more expensive, larger recommendation, somebody else who's also an audiophile will tell you, no, that one's crap, that's still terrible, but if you spend twice as much money and get something twice as big, then it will be perfect. And they just keep going and going and going because when it comes to subjective things like audio quality, you know, there are ways to quantize audio quality, but when you get into very high-end stuff, it can sort of turn into a matter of personal preference. And so with fields like that, where there is science and math involved, but there's also personal personal preference involved, you can really just keep going and going and getting into more expensive and larger systems, uh, basically to infinity and never be happy with what you've got. Once again, my desk is currently in my bedroom and I'm currently back down to a one desk setup. I've got my computer tower back there on the same desk as the screen and I've gone down to only one monitor right now because I don't have enough space to comfortably have two monitors on this desk at the same time. So I didn't want a pair of large bookshelf speakers, even though bookshelf monitors might have been better quality than these Audio Engine A2 Pluses. Like I said, I started out looking for desktop speakers and that's what I wanted. Now I might end up getting a subwoofer for these. The sound sticks would have had a subwoofer with them. Uh, with the sound sticks, I basically would have had to put the subwoofer on the desk once again, at least with the sound stick threes to keep all kinds of dust and dirt from getting into it. The sound stick fours, I might have been able to put the subwoofer uh, on the ground because one thing that it doesn't look as nice as the threes, but I do think practically it's better is that the sound stick fours, the subwoofer is closed on the top. It's a closed dome, so you don't have dust or anything getting into it. But Audio Engine sells a subwoofer for their speakers as well. They've got a couple different sizes of subwoofer, and I might end up getting one, uh, but first of all, I just wanted to get a pair of desktop speakers, get them in my hands, and just see how they are, because like I said, it was very stressful looking online, and just every single option for this price point, for this sort of size class, um, you know, there are people who say they're great, and there are people who say they're terrible. Um, I actually looked up the specifications for the Apple Pro speakers that I was happy with. Once again, if I could plug those into this computer, I probably wouldn't have bought speakers at all. And the Apple Pro speakers, uh, the problem with them is that they've got a proprietary connector and you can convert it to standard 3.5 millimeter connectors, uh, but that requires basically permanently altering the cable, which I didn't want to do. You know, those are sort of a vintage product. I want to keep them compatible with the vintage Mac that they go with. But that's why I'm not just using the Apple Pro speakers uh, with my computer here. But those have a two inch driver in either speaker. And the frequency range for those Pro speakers, I believe it was 70 Hertz up to 20 kilohertz. And I was happy with that. Now the Audio Engine A2 Pluses, they have 2.75 inch woofers, so slightly larger main drivers. Each one also has a 0.75 inch tweeter for higher frequencies. And the frequency range on these goes from 65 hertz 
to 22 kilohertz. So it goes just slightly lower and just slightly higher than those Apple Pro speakers did. So all I'm gonna do in this video for the rest of the video, now that I've ranted about how hard it is to decide on a pair of speakers, is I'm going to unbox these. I have stands for them uh, that will angle the speakers up slightly. I also have the speakers themselves. Once we've got them open, I'm just going to set them up on my desk and I'm going to just listen to a couple of things and give you a very quick first impression and tell you if I think that these are acceptable as desktop speakers or not. So let's go ahead, I will guess I'll try to bring the camera in in this very cramped room that I'm in. All right, well here we are at my desk. I'm doing this a little differently from normal. I'm standing up because there's not enough room to really get the chair in here, but the desk is at sitting position. This is a sit-stand desk, as longtime viewers are probably aware. So I'm just going to cut this thing open. Hopefully you'll be able to see all of it. Um, so this is a pretty plain box for the speakers themselves. We've got a brown box with some writing printed onto it. It's funny, they say Audio Engine 2 Plus Wireless. They don't say A2 Plus. I don't know if they count the A at the beginning as being part of the A2 Plus. If we take a look on this side, we've got a sticker with the serial number, and those do say A2 Plus Wireless for the model. There is no non-wireless version. With their larger bookshelf speakers, the A5, I believe, is the wired model, and the A5 Plus has their more advanced Bluetooth. The A5s might actually have some Bluetooth, but... Audio Engine is very proud of some kind of high quality, low latency Bluetooth version that they've incorporated into their most recent speakers. I'm probably not going to be using Bluetooth on these ever. I'm definitely not going to be using it very often in the near future. I really only care about the wired connectivity. But anyway, the point was, I'm not sure why wired this is part of the model number when there is no wired version. Continuing though, uh, this looks identical to the opposite side. This looks pretty identical to the opposite side. Um, so very, very simple box. We've got the top there. Um, we'll take a quick look at the bottom while we can. Nothing printed on the bottom of the box. All right, well, let's cut the box open and we'll take a look at the speakers themselves. One thing that I do like so far about Audio Engine as a company is that they have a very trial-friendly ordering process uh, through their website. They've got a very easy 30-day return policy, which is part of the reason why I was able to tear myself away from all the audiophile forums, some of which were telling me that this was a terrible product to purchase and go ahead and try them out for myself because uh, you can return them within 30 days. You do have to pay for your own return shipping if you are returning for a money refund. Um, if you're returning for store credit, they will cover the return shipping. But for shipping here, they actually have free shipping through their website. Um, so you don't have to go through Amazon or B&H or anyone to get free shipping. You can get that directly from Audio Engine. And then they also, uh, they cover the sales tax. So if you buy through their website in the United States, at least here in Colorado, I did not have to pay sales tax, which I think according to Colorado law, that not sure how legal that was for them to cover sales tax. Some states make it a little difficult, but I'm not going to complain. So here we have uh, what we see from the top. It looks like we've actually got, this was not the outer box that it shipped in. I took both of these small boxes out of the slightly larger shipping box already that had my address on it. But at this point, we've got a another box inside of here that I think is going to have a little bit more, more graphics on it. So we'll just try to turn this upside down and trying to keep all the packaging in one piece. Nothing else in that outer brown box. And this internal one is basically the same size. Um, nothing printed there while I've got it flipped over, but Okay, so here is the, uh, the product box for the A2 Pluses. This is probably the one you'd see if you walk into a you know, Walmart or Best Buy or something and try to look for these. I don't know who carries these in person and who doesn't. Um, I am a little concerned. You know, I ordered the black version. Okay, it says satin black. Um, the stands, I got concerned earlier because I also ordered the black version of the stands. These look silver. Um, it looks like there's no powder coating on this image, but the box says color black on it, so... I think they just don't uh, don't update the pictures for the box. Actually, they're black on this side of the box. Uh, they've got white on three sides and then black on the final side. So that's inconsistent, but you know, whatever. Uh, we'll open this up. 
there was also a red version of these, and I, I actually considered, the red version was a, a little bit cheaper. They had a discount. It was like a $40 discount on this glossy red version. Um, as you can see, my Focusrite Scarlet, as suggested by the name, is also red there on my desk. So I thought about getting the red versions because I wouldn't mind some more color, but I'm not sure uh, you know how the setup's going to evolve. Um, and black is a much more neutral, much safer color for matching other equipment. And I didn't want a really distracting color on both sides of my monitor all the time. Whether it's when I'm watching things using these speakers, you don't want to be distracted. And when I'm not using the speakers, you also don't want them to distract you. Um, so we've got a couple of pouches on the top here. And one thing about these A2 Pluses that I noticed when I was researching them is that they include a lot of extras. Like I said, they've got the really fast, uh, low latency Bluetooth, the high quality Bluetooth connection. They also give you microfiber pouches to hold basically everything that comes in this box. And I actually appreciate that because, you know, I've, I've moved around quite a bit um, and I understand how much of a pain in the butt it can be. Some of my equipment, you know, this display, for instance, I put it back in its original box from BenQ every time I move it. And that's kind of a pain in the butt to do and the box falls apart slightly more every time I do that. Um, then I've got other things like my keyboard, my mouse, my audio interface. I don't have the boxes for those things here. I've either discarded them entirely. In the case of the keyboard, I never had one because that was a used keyboard when I got it. Or the Focusrite, I might still have its box, but it's back uh, at another place in Missouri, not where I'm currently in Colorado. So they get scratched up and dinged up a little bit every time I move them around as well. So it's actually very helpful for me to have microfiber bags. You know, these are going to break down really small and be able to, to fold and just stash wherever. Um, but then it also makes it easy to move them around when you're moving your entire desk setup. Um, it also makes it easy to take these places since they are Bluetooth. Theoretically, you could take this to, say, a party at a friend's house or you know, if you're meeting up, uh, you can't take it to a park because I don't think they're battery powered at all. The only reason I say I don't think is because it's confusing to me how they market these as being portable when you have to carry um, the power adapters, which is actually what's in uh, one of these bags. So that microfiber bag just had a power brick. Um, we've actually got some, some fluff and stuff from the bag itself sticking to the power brick. So they maybe didn't think that packaging decision through. Uh, but yeah, this is part of the AC adapter, I believe. Looks like we've got a C5 connector that's going to plug in there. Is that C5 or is that C3? I don't remember off the top of my head the differences. C5 might be with a third pin for grounding that this does not have. But yeah, that bag had half of the power assembly in it. And then this other bag, trying to not have my arms get in the way of the camera, I guess, here. Once again, the uh, setup right now is not great. Um, okay, so inside of that microfiber bag. This one actually came in a plastic bag separately, which I sort of would have expected the other one to. But we can take a look inside of this plastic bag and we've got a two prong outlet plug. And the other side of that plugs into the power brick. So there is our power stuff. Set that over and we will take out of this bag the rest of the cables. Um, we've got a 3.5 millimeter audio cable, so one of these can plug into the speaker, the other one plugs into a computer or a phone. Some people call that an aux cable, auxiliary. We've also got a USB cable. So one of these connectors is USB type B, and the other connector is USB type A. It looks like this is a USB 2.0 cable, not a 3.0 or higher cable as it is not blue or red. But the speakers actually have a DAC in them. Um, I've obviously got my Focusrite Scarlet there. I might try plugging these in through the Focusrite Scarlet first. DAC stands for Digital Audio Converter. You know, something in your audio chain has to convert a digital signal to a physical analog audio signal. When you plug in headphones directly to your computer, you're usually using a built-in DAC on your motherboard. Um, um, I've got an external DAC of the focus right there, and the only real reason I have that is because I need it to run my XLR microphone that I'm using right now. However, I do actually notice a slightly higher quality with my headphones, which are monitor headphones, using them through the focus right versus plug directly into my computer. So using a high quality DAC does make a difference. Now these speakers, you don't even need a DAC if you don't want, because the speakers themselves also have a DAC, so you can just plug in, get a digital signal from your computer's USB port, and then the speakers themselves will convert that to analog before they play the 
sound. So those are two of the connection options. And then here we've got some speaker cable. Now for me, I would prefer personally if the speakers just had like a 3.5 inch connector between them um, or you know any sort of connector that has a plug. The speaker cable, as you can see, this is uh, just open on the ends. And we're going to connect up two of these to one speaker and two of them to the other speaker. Um, I think the left speaker is the main one with the DAC and then the right speaker is sort of passive. The reason why it's an advantage to have classic speaker cable like this that does not actually have a plug on the end of it is that you can cut it at any point um, and then just shuck a little bit of the plastic off. And so if this is too long for your desk, if you want to cut down an extra cables lying around your desk, you can actually cut this cable shorter and it won't cause any bad side effects. It will actually probably decrease the delay by a minuscule amount if you make the cable shorter. People who are really into professional audio probably have spools of this stuff sitting around anyway. Um, and so using standard classic speaker cable is an advantage. Once again, for me, a computer guy, uh, things with actual tips on them that I can plug in and out just seems a little bit safer and more normal to me. But you know, the whole point of this whole experience is seeing how the speakers work. So uh, we'll see how they work after I connect the speaker cable up between them. That is everything in the second bag. I keep having to move to check what's in frame and what's not if it seems like everything's happening off center. I apologize. Um, but anyway, in this box, what I'm taking out right now is this foam from the top. So that was holding the accessories on the top and then the bottom of it pads each speaker. And here is what the rest of the inside of the box looks like. Uh, we will take out one speaker at a time here. And the speakers are also in microfiber bags. Once again, I do appreciate this for future portability of the system, even though I don't think that the speakers themselves are really suitable to be super portable, especially since they use analog audio cable. I mean, you don't wanna have this stuff just tossed in a bag somewhere. I guess they give you the bag to move it around. But you know, any sort of debris or damage that occurs to the open wiring here, I mean, you can always cut it off and shuck more of the plastic off if you want the end to be fresh. But I don't know, something about them marketing this as an on-the-go speaker system um, and then just giving you this super classic cable, and I do believe this is the only way to actually connect the two speakers together. There's lots of ways to connect other things to the speaker system, but the speaker system requires this. Yeah, it just seems uh, a little funny to me, that's all. All right, so here is one of the speakers we are going to open up. Jeez, I'm really trying not to just have my arm covering the entire camera, and I'm trying not to break any of the packaging but we can tear off the tape nice and gently from the styrofoam there, perfect. So let's see which speaker we have here first, and it looks like it's upside down. All right, so the bottom of each speaker is going to be a sort of solid foam material. If you don't have a stand for it, it is going to be somewhat isolated from the material it's sitting on by that foam. Um, and you can see right here what the front of the speaker looks like. So that's what you're gonna be looking at if this thing is sitting on your desk. There was another pair of speakers that were very similar to these in size, very similar in reviews. Um, some reviews said that they had a slightly flatter sound curve, whereas these might have a little bit heavier mids. What were they called? They were the Kanto U2s. I thought about getting Kanto U2s since they were a little bit cheaper. One of the things that turned me off of those was that I saw some photos and just from the videos I was looking at, I could tell their quality control was not quite as tight as audio engines is. With the Cantos, you sometimes would have glue and things on the speaker cone itself or sort of hanging off. Um, but this is a professionally manufactured product here uh, from Audio Engine. So like I said, um, technically it's supposed to be a 2.75 inch woofer and then a 0.75 inch tweeter above that. We do have a port at the bottom. So these are technically ported speakers, not sealed. Now on the back, okay, so all we've got are the speaker wire connectors. So this would be the right side speaker. We're gonna take the other one out of the box. Okay, and it's hard to tell. It almost seems like the microfiber bags are a little bit scuffed up, um, but it is you know, a very delicate material. So it might've just been like that from the start. Uh, but here we have some more styrofoam. I'm going to carefully open this up. All right, and I had a very small styrofoam tear there because they put the tape right over the seam in the styrofoam. But we can open this up now and we can pull out the left speaker. There we are. So the front of it is going to look extremely similar, basically identical to the right. 
But if we look at the back on this left speaker, we've actually got some more connectors than on the right one. Once again, um, the speaker wire is going to connect from these larger connectors to these. Um, so the left speaker is going to send the right speaker its signal. Then you connect your device to the left speaker, either via Bluetooth or via RCA, if you're using a, an early 2000s home entertainment system with a VCR or something like that. Or if you're using a computer or a phone, you've also got a 3.5 millimeter input. Um, or with a computer, you've also got that USB input. So lots of options here. For Bluetooth, we do have a pairing button, which is good. Um, if you're like me and you're not gonna use the Bluetooth, you don't want them sitting open all the time where other people could connect to them when you're not expecting it. That was one of my other concerns about the Soundstick 4s. I read a lot of reviews that said that they actually didn't have a way to turn off Bluetooth. Um, the sound sticks, it sounded like if you paired at least one device with it, then it would not go into pairing mode until you told it to. Uh, with the audio engines, hopefully I don't have to pair anything with it at all. Hopefully it just won't enter that mode unless I push the button. Uh, but we do have a serial number sticker on the left speaker. Just checking in this box over here, we've got two packs of silica gel, I guess. And the only other thing in that box is a small plastic bag with some paper documentation. And the bag's actually slightly oversized for the documents there. We can take a look here. We've got premium powered speakers, they call them. Um, so Qualcomm AptX, that is the Bluetooth technology that they're using that is apparently better than regular old Bluetooth audio. I, I don't know all the details. Once again, I tend to avoid wireless in my setups wherever I can. Um, I'm surprised I even use a wireless mouse, honestly. Uh, but we've got a lot of information there. They do note there's sort of a break-in period, 40 to 50 hours of actually using the speakers um, will apparently sort of allow the woofers to become a little bit more flexible and have the best sound that they are able to have and that they were designed for. Not sure if that break-in period has to do with the woofers being made out of a tougher composite material. They're not just paper cones. Um, the Kanto U2s that I considered were paper cones. Uh, but yeah, here we've basically got, we've got a port guide, which I think they did a good job labeling the ports on the system itself. So I probably won't need to refer to that. Um, they've got warranty info and they've got uh, an FCC notice probably because of the Bluetooth. And also in that plastic bag, we had a smaller card or is this a booklet? Uh, it's a very small booklet. Uh, it's got a thank you message for purchasing. Um, and you can flip through here, I guess. Oh, it actually unfolds. It's an accordion. So yeah, just pure marketing stuff, nothing useful on that side. Uh, and then on this side, we've got quick setup guide, just in case the other paper manual was not enough for you. It's funny, if they were gonna ship the QR codes and stuff, I would expect them to drop the actual paper manual. Um, I guess I don't see a reason not to do both, but just kind of interesting. So I'll drop all of that back into the bag. We will take this sort of large box off of the desk. Okay, and then we will open the stands up. Now, some people are probably also going to tell me that I should not have bought the stands directly from Audio Engine. The reason for that being that they were a little bit expensive for stands uh, buying from Audio Engine. The speakers were about $270, I believe. The stands were $40 for the set of them. So yeah, you can probably find cheaper stands out there. Canto's stands of a similar style are, I think, $10 less. Once again, Kanto stands, I saw reviews saying that the foam was very thin. The pictures of them didn't look finished as nicely. So you get what you pay for in terms of anything really. But yeah, pretty plain box here. We've just got wireframe drawings on most of the sides. Um, and then the color drawings in the wrong color up on the top. So we can just pull this tab open here. And we've got another box inside of a box. I can grab one of those holes there and pull that out. This box is completely empty now. And the outside box was toolless for opening, but the inside box has tape on it. So we will cut that open. We'll open that up. And okay, these are larger than I was expecting, honestly, even though they match the size of the speakers. So I'm not sure why I was expecting smaller. Inside of each of these bubble wrap bags, which thankfully have no tape on them, uh, we have a stand. So we'll take both of those out and then we'll take a look at them. Um, the foam is definitely a substantial thickness. Not sure how well you can see that, but the foam is probably about as thick. It looks like actually the foam is thicker than the metal itself. Um, so if you're worried about the foam being low quality or wearing out, I would say you're probably pretty safe in that regard. Um, we do have foam both on the bottom where this is going to sit on your desk. It's also got foam on the top 
where the speaker is going to sit. So you've got double foam in addition to the foam on the speakers already. They will be very well isolated by the time they're sitting on these. We do also have a little bit of foam on the back stops so the back of the speakers won't get scratched up. And we can actually set the speakers on them. to see how those look. Now the reason that these stands are recommended, at least some stands are recommended for desktop speakers is because the speakers are supposed to be pointing sort of towards your ears. So when the speakers are on your desk, wherever you're gonna set them, obviously I'm gonna put them on either side of my display, the angle of these cones are supposed to be pointed as closely as possible towards your head. So the stands that Audio Engine sells, there's a slightly cheaper version that's a solid sort of rubber. It's not even solid, it's a hollow rubber stand. And then you've got these slightly more expensive, nicer looking metal and foam ones. These stands, as well as the comparable Kanto stands, they all have a 15 degree tilt that they provide. And these audio engine stands, they also lift up a little bit, um, just straight up from the desk in addition to providing that tilt. The stands are powder coated metal. They mentioned that it was powder coated in their marketing for them. I was a little concerned about that because I'm not a fan at all of powder coated metal. Uh, powder coated metal to me, if it's done poorly, you can get a lot of little nicks and things in the powder coating. And then when you try to clean them off with say a microfiber cloth, your cloth just tears, leaves threads hanging on to all of those nicks. And so it might look okay from a distance, but when you get up close, powder coated metal to me can really be ugly and does not feel good to work with. These seem to be pretty smooth. I'm feeling around them. Um, I do feel some nicks and things that's natural for powder coated metal, but yeah, they, they look pretty clean in general. Okay, so I don't wanna make this video way too generic. Um, I would be upset if somebody did not show me how to actually connect the speaker wire up, which almost none of the videos on YouTube do. They all just say, oh, these are the speakers, and then they cut to when they're all connected up. I'm gonna show you how this wire actually works. Kanto has a video guide showing how to connect this on their speakers. Audio Engine, I don't think they do, they might since they had all those QR codes in the documentation. But anyway, I'm just gonna turn these around. I'm gonna take them off the stands for just a second while I'm doing this. These do feel very solid. They are um, kind of heavy when I pick them up. Obviously that doesn't mean everything because the cones themselves, most speaker cones are paper, which is extremely lightweight, but it does give me confidence that they are well built. All right, so I have taken off the bread tie that they give you from the speaker cable. And if we take a look at how long this is, I've actually got a tape measure right here. So I'm going to measure that out. All right, that is actually longer than this tape measure here. This tape measure is five feet long. So I think we've got about six feet of speaker cable here. Honestly, it's probably listed in their specifications, but yeah, I would put it at about six feet long. So as you can see, the color of these two wires is slightly different. One of them is more of a red, the other one's more silver. It does not actually matter which one you use for which channel. You know, those wires are going to work the same. And looking closer, I don't think it's even the wires themselves that are differently colored. Um, it's whatever jacketing they've got in there. There's a, a clear plastic jacket, then they've got some kind of threaded metal jacket on the inside, probably to prevent crosstalk interference between the two wires. Uh, but yeah, as long as you match red to red and black to black when you're going between these, um, as you can see, the rings on the speakers are actually colored. And these are not actually for left and right. We've already got our left and right speakers here. Um, you wouldn't need to connect two cables from one to the other if it was for left and right. I believe it's positive and negative. This actually creates a loop between the two speakers is how this works. Um, and so red would be positive, black would be negative. But yeah, the, the wire, as long as you connect positive to positive and negative to negative, um, you'll be good to go. If you don't do that, it probably won't work. All right, so to connect this up, we are going to just unscrew. Yeah, we can unscrew all of these. And yeah, I was unclear how this worked. Is there a loop that I put them through? I wasn't sure if you stick this cable in to the back that you see here, um, or if you're supposed to just wedge it in. Let me figure out how this works so I can tell you. All right, so I just discovered a couple of things. For one thing, these rings that I'm unscrewing, you can hear me screwing and unscrewing those maybe. My microphone's not pointed toward them, but these rings do have a stopper, so you cannot take these rings entirely off. Don't worry about accidentally doing that. Um, they're not gonna fall off, you know, as long as you don't use ridiculous force. Now, when the rings are fully unscrewed, you can see there is a hole in each of these sort of screw threaded things. 
Uh, and basically, this is all just metal. Um, it's just an electrical connection that we're creating. So you probably don't want to touch this too much when it's working, you know, just for the sake of sound quality. I don't think it would actually hurt you, the level of electricity going through these. But, you know, you certainly don't want to touch the threaded part. And probably I would just avoid touching anything in this output section. But yeah, we've got those holes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put the wires through those holes. And you can do them one at a time if you'd like. But as you can see, maybe they're actually sticking all the way through. Uh, the wire that I've put in on one side, it's sticking through those holes into the other side. And then we just tighten. And I'm not going to over tighten. I don't want to break the speaker wire because the speaker wire is really a bunch of smaller wires threaded together. I can see that being an issue. But yeah, we just tighten those in. Uh, we screw in those rings and that wire is now being held in there um, and that will create electrical contact for us. So that's all that you need to do. I may have done that in the wrong orientation, uh, but yeah, you do the same thing on the other speaker. You put it through the holes in there and you screw to tighten. So I am going to fix the orientation here. Then I'm going to set this system up on the stands, sort of back farther on my desk, and then we'll see how they actually sound. All right, guys, so I've got the speakers uh, connected up. I've got them plugged in. I do have them sitting on my desk on their stands. Now I do have to say these speakers look very nice. Um, obviously looks are not the important thing when it comes to speakers. The important thing is sound, but the speakers look very classy. You know, when it comes to things sitting on your desk all the time, like I said, you don't want them to be distracting. You don't want them to be an eyesore. Um, I wasn't sure, like I said, how the sound sticks would or wouldn't have incorporated themselves into this desk setup. The A2 pluses, I mean, they match my desktop and my current monitor perfectly. My next desktop might actually be a lighter color scheme. Um, and it might not have a window. I'm thinking like a normal, just brushed aluminum look with the standard silver color for that. Might be how I go if I make another desktop in the future. But with the current desk setup, you know, the black desk and everything, uh, they look great. Next to the Focusrite Scarlet that's red, uh, they look perfectly fine. So I'm happy with that. Um, now, the one thing I haven't done yet is connect them to the computer. So I guess the first thing I'll do is actually plug in via 3.5 millimeter to the Focusrite Scarlet, and I'll play something out of there to see how it sounds. Um, I'm going to mess with the USB connection afterwards. I want to save the audio for this video that I have so far before I do that, just in case plugging in another DAC messes with pipe wire on my computer. All right, so I have just plugged in 3.5 millimeter. Um, the Focusrite Scarlet, it only has quarter inch output. I've got a probably 50 cent adapter from Monoprice in there. That's the same adapter I use with my headphones. So I know that adapter is good. Um, I've got that 3.5 millimeter cable connected into the leftmost speaker. Now the speakers are not on yet. I'm going to rotate the volume dial to turn it on right now. All right, so it should be on and Interesting. All right, so I can hear sound coming out of it. The sound just for my audio adjustment, it honestly, it sounds like there's a lot of static coming through for some reason uh, when, I, when I hit the volume up and down. Now I am just using the stock KDE effects for audio up and down, volume up and down, so you know, it could be that those are low quality volume adjustment sounds. With the Apple Pro speakers that I mentioned I was really happy with, I could immediately tell that I was going to like the speakers as soon as I heard the Mac volume up and down sound effect going through them compared to the iMac G4 speakers. I could hear how much more bass there was in those Apple Pro speakers than in the iMac G4's built-in speakers simply from that volume up and down sound. Once again, maybe KDE's sound effects just aren't quite as nice, or maybe the speakers aren't quite as nice. I'm not sure yet. I am going to open up KDE Elisa now. I'm going to just listen to a couple of the songs and try to figure out what I think of these things.
All right, so that was one of the songs that I actually used a little bit of in the iMac video to demonstrate those Apple Pro speakers um, and how much they could fill up a room with sound. That was very interesting. These speakers, the first thing that came to mind was they certainly are not blowing my socks off like the Apple Pro speakers did. Um, now, once again, I, I wasn't necessarily, I guess, expecting a lot out of those used I mean, they were an eBay special, the Apple Pro speakers, along with that entire computer. I got the computer and refurbished it myself, and the Apple Pro speakers, I don't remember what condition they were advertised in. I probably did have to clean them up a bit. But yeah, the Apple Pro speakers immediately had a sort of wow factor, and I'm not getting quite the same wow factor with these. Um, they don't sound bad, and as the song went on, I actually started liking the sound a little bit more. I will say the stereo separation, I'm not sure if that's the technical term audiophiles would use, but uh, the stereo separation is definitely there. Uh, that song has some really little high-pitched percussion that goes back and forth between the two sides, and I could definitely hear, once I started listening for it, that it was going back and forth between the two sides. Now, I'm currently sitting sort of behind the camera. The camera is actually sitting where I should be sitting normally. Um, or even slightly behind it, and I am behind the camera. So the angle that I'm listening to these at in the distance is not the exact same distance that I normally will be. You might have heard I adjusted the volume a little bit throughout that test listen to see how it responded. And I think I was happier with the sound when it was actually playing louder. Uh, when it was quieter, it sounded lower quality, but as I turned it up higher, the quality of the speakers I think might have started to come through a little bit more. Now normally, once again, I'm not going to have the speakers playing very loudly um, if my housemate who I'm renting from is here, since I don't want to disturb that person. But yeah, definitely not a bad first impression. Maybe slightly underwhelming at first, but you know, I was listening, I, I heard some reviews say that these speakers lack treble and also lack bass since they don't have a subwoofer. But you know, the treble at least, I think the treble through those tweeters did sound very good. Uh, the higher treble. And I didn't feel like the mids were necessarily overpowering anything like I heard some people describe. Um, I am going to listen to another song now. This one has vocals and it also has a little bit more bass. I'm going to adjust the angle of this left speaker a little bit more. Um, normally the speakers probably technically should be angled in actually further than they are. I'm probably going to keep them slightly less angled uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, to save space on the desk depth wise. Number two, because once again, I'm not normally going to be using them so it's not super important. They're pointed right at my ears. Number three, once again, because normally when I'm using these, somebody else will be sitting next to me. Neither of us are going to be centered, and it, the speakers cannot be centered on both of our heads at the same time. So if the speakers actually required perfect precision on the triangle angle towards your head to sound good, then it wouldn't work, because I'm not going to have that anyway with the intended use case. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to adjust that angle, um, and yeah, I'm going to listen to another one. I'm interested what I'm going to think of the bass. I've listened to the song a few times in my car, which has a lot more bass than what I normally hear, even through my headphones. My headphones have a very flat sound curve since they are studio monitors. So I'm interested if I'm going to be disappointed in the bass or if it's going to be okay. Um, and it might determine if I try to pick up a subwoofer for these or not. You know, while adjusting the speakers, I realized it doesn't actually have to do with the volume. Yeah, the volume being up or down does not affect the volume of this, uh, but there actually is a little bit of a hiss coming through the speakers when they're idle. Um, that might not happen if I switch over to the USB, which I will do in just a minute, but that is interesting. Another thing that I noticed is that there's some sort of small, it looks like maybe either a glue string or a hair on the left woofer. Um, I'm going to grab a microfiber cloth from the other room and just take care of that really quickly. All right, I am moving the microphone back a little bit, maybe a little bit closer to where my head will normally be when I'm listening to these, just to try and give you a sort of accurate sound test. Uh, this room is not set up for sound tests. I do have carpet, so at least there's not a lot of echo, uh, but there is a lot of sound coming from my computer right next to the speakers, uh, but that's how it's normally going to be. <laughs>
right, well, that one was very interesting. I noticed some of the same things I did the first time. They kind of sounded like, you know, at, at lower volumes, at the lowest volumes that I listened at, they really sounded a lot cheaper. And then as I turned the volume up, um, they sounded more premium in terms of audio quality. Now, it's interesting. Part of the reason why that is, I think, is that I also noticed uh, with the volume turned down, the entire thing was low. Trebles were low, basses were low, obviously, when the volume is really low. As I turned the volume up, it seemed like I saw a greater increase in the bass than in the higher trebles um, and even the mids. It seemed like the bass went up with the volume more and the trebles and mids sort of stayed more similar as I adjusted the volume up and down. So when the speakers were at a higher volume, it really sounded pretty good. You know, in terms of a subwoofer, like I mentioned before, I don't think that a subwoofer is what I would need to complete this sound. I don't think there's something missing right now that a subwoofer would necessarily add, unless maybe a subwoofer would be able to reproduce lower bass sounds at lower volumes. I'll have to look into if that's a thing or not. But yeah, with the volume sort of high, you know, that, like I said, that song has some bass in it, and I have heard it on a variety of speaker systems, some of which are quite bass heavy. Um, and yeah, with the volume high, the bass there was everything that I need in terms of bass. You know, you can call me a heathen for not needing a ton of bass. And obviously some speakers are very flat, but they are still able to recreate lower bass sounds. They just don't boost the bass. And there's a difference between not boosting the bass and not being able to recreate lower frequencies. There is a difference between those things. So the fact that I prefer a more natural, more flat sound these days over boosted bass, I don't think that not having a subwoofer is necessarily directly connected to that. But yeah, my impression was that they've got all the bass that I need. Um, I don't think that, that the size of the cones is limiting the sound necessarily. Um, yeah, like I said, it just it did seem at lower volumes, which I normally wouldn't be listening at, uh, but it, it seemed like at lower volumes, like it was a little emptier as I turned the volume up, obviously it became fuller, but it, uh, you know, it wasn't like a linear, it wasn't all of the frequencies going up in volume at once. It really seemed like the lows were going up in volume the fastest, which benefits you the most when you're listening at slightly higher volumes. Okay, well at this point I'm going to stop the camera, I'm going to stop the audio recording, save that, and I'm going to switch over to the USB. Um, really, I can switch my audio output through my computer, um, and it's not like if the DAC in the speakers works better with the speakers than the Focusrite, I, I can't think of any reason why I shouldn't take advantage of that. So I'm going to switch over to the USB cable. I'm going to see if that static goes away, if that sort of really quiet hiss goes away when I've switched over to USB. And I'm also going to see if it sounds any different. All right, so I have just rearranged things a little bit. I'm now sitting at my desk, a lot closer to where I will normally be sitting. I switched over to USB. I notice the hissing in the background is still there. Once again, doesn't seem to have anything to do with the volume. However, right now at this moment, it only seems to be coming out of the left speaker. And I thought I said it was coming out of both speakers before. I don't know if that has to do with switching over the cable or if I'm just misremembering. Actually, let me just make sure that I'm sending, uh, how is this configured right now? Analog stereo output, pro audio. All right, the pro audio option, <laughs> I don't know what that is supposed to do in pulse audio volume control, but that does nothing. Okay, at this point, I'm not sure I'm getting any sound out of the right speaker. All right, guys, so interesting thing just happened. I think when I was switching over to USB, the negative connection came free over on the left speaker. Uh, when I was moving wires around. And it's funny, because I was just moving this around a little bit. I don't want to mess with it too much, not connected how it's supposed to be. But yeah, it sounded like I was actually getting that hissing out of the right speaker when this was touching any metal, including just the back of the speaker. I did hear the volume adjustment sound coming out of the right speaker sometimes, but I, I think it was probably making contact with the terminal when that was happening. Um, this is exactly why I would prefer a speaker system where the two speakers connect to each other, once again, using a plug rather than using loose wire that you have to screw into place. Obviously, I didn't screw it tightly enough as it came loose because I was trying not to damage the wires. But yeah, that is why that was happening. And I will need to be careful about that in the future. Basically, any time that I am moving either of the speakers around, 
now that I know that that does fall out quite easily, I will try to tighten it a little bit better this time. Um, okay, so we'll put that back. And I am curious, I realized I had the volume basically maxed out uh, when I was doing those tests earlier on the Focusrite. And the Focusrite also has a volume control that I normally don't touch very much uh, when using my headphones. I'm curious if we're going to see any different performance uh, boosting more through the computer versus through the speakers. I would imagine it's normally better to send more signal. So if we, if we turn the speakers down a little bit and then send more from the computer, maybe that'll give us a more flattering sound. We'll see. All right, so let's listen again with this connection and with those tweaks. And once again, I'll see if it sounds any differently. Okay, well, for that one, I think that that actually helped. At least one of the adjustments we did helped with the lower volumes. It did not sound as empty at lower volumes. Once again, could just be because I'm sitting closer to the speakers as intended now. If I had to guess, I would say that the biggest thing that would impact that might be turning the volume on the speaker down and then the volume on the computer up so that we're sending more signal from the source and the speakers are not amplifying a weaker signal. If I had to guess, that is what uh, just caused that difference to occur. It seemed like that difference in bass versus the rest of it when adjusting the volume that I had mentioned before, um, it seemed like the lower I turned the speaker down, the less of a difference that actually was, the more that, that effect went away. Um, and so the bass was more consistent with the rest of the sound at different volume levels when the speaker was set to a lower volume and I was adjusting more through the computer. It is a balance. I think I've got more control over the volume in this sort of setup anyway, because with the speaker turned way up high, every five percentage step on the computer really changes the, the volume a ton. With the speakers turned very low, when you have to have the sound turned up pretty darn high on the computer, and it's funny because I, you know, it almost sounds like my music that I'm playing is somehow way louder than my volume adjustment indicator, which once again would be a KDE pipe wire thing. But you have more control, though each individual step does not do as much when you're pumped very close to the maximum anyway on the computer in order to compensate for the speakers being turned down sort of low. So that's interesting. I'm gonna do the other song one more time. Turn it down first. All right, well, I think you might have seen me uh, adjusting things throughout the song there. Yeah, it's really interesting. I actually think the speakers sound really, really good when the computer is at 100% and the speaker is set to the volume that I want it. Uh, whereas when the speakers are turned up higher and the computer is around 50%, where I normally keep it when using my headphones, for example, then it doesn't sound as good. It sounds emptier and cheaper. 
Um, it's really interesting, and that's something that you don't see people talk about that particularly in a lot of reviews. You know, people. I understand the concept of a a frequency graph, you know, uh, and the frequency curve that speakers are able to replicate. But I don't know if that's not something people normally talk about, or if I just that's something that I haven't been understanding when reading reviews. Uh, but yeah, the speakers, it really, it's a very balanced sound. There's a lot of bass, a lot of mid, a lot of treble, and it all comes together very nicely. Once again, when the speaker uh, is turned way down and when the computer is sending out 100% volume, um, and on the other hand, when the computer is closer to halfway or 60 to 75% and the speaker is turned up quite a bit louder, it's the same volume, but it sounds like it's more bass heavy. Uh, and, and the treble and mids don't come through as much in that sort of setup. So yeah, that's very, very interesting. Um, I'm not 100% sure if I'm going to keep these. Uh, like I said, they've got a really easy return policy. I'm, I'm going to try them out a little bit more off video. Uh, but yeah, those were my first impressions. It is sort of unfortunate. You know, most people recommend that you use your computer to adjust the volume because the volume knob is on the back of these speakers and not the front. And, you know, one of the reasons why I like the design of these speakers better than the Kanto U2s is because the U2s have a bright LED on the front, and these are very minimalistic on the front. They don't have any distractions for you on the front of the speakers. Um, I actually like the shape of the Kanto U2s better than these. Um, these are a little bit more rounded, these audio engines, and they look good, uh, don't get me wrong. But, yeah, it's... Um, it's interesting, they put those volume controls on the back of the speaker, so they, it, they are discouraging you from using those. You're supposed to set that once and then adjust it over on the computer or the phone or whatever device you have plugged in. And yeah, you just, it's really interesting that it would affect it like that. I'm, I'm not sure how I'm going to end up using them permanently. It's really inconvenient to have the volume actually at 100% on the computer because small adjustments, um, if you want to turn it up just a little bit, you have to go to the physical knob. Um, if you're already 100% on the computer, I guess, I mean, I can digitally boost it on the computer, but um, that's going to lose quality, I think, if I do that. So yeah, I do think that they are, when they are in that optimal configuration of the very strong source signal, um, and the speakers are turned down low, they certainly are just as good or better than the Apple Pro speakers. Um, and the normal configuration, I would probably, you know, I don't have the Apple Pro speakers with me right now. It's inconvenient uh, because, yeah, I would like to compare them side by side, but I don't have the room. I don't have the space in this room to get that iMac G4 out and plug it in and set it up uh, with its keyboard and mouse and, and the speakers very easily. But I'm pretty sure that they are, these audio engines are just as good, even in the more normal configuration. I'm not 100%, but I think they are. I am interested, now that I discovered that, I want to set the angle back to how I had it before. Sort of a flatter angle where they're not tilted in like they're actually supposed to be, uh, because it saves space in multiple dimensions on the desk when they are flatter. Um, so if we just play a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, the angle thing doesn't seem to affect it that much for me sitting here right now. Um, the stands definitely have them pointed towards my face versus they would be more towards my chest if they weren't on those stands. But uh, the left to right angle, I didn't feel that I was drastically improving the sound when I turned them more towards me versus when they were... Uh, sitting back flat like this. All right, guys, I want to keep this video under an hour and it's a few weeks later, so I'm just going to record a really quick outro here. Like I explained at the beginning of the video, these speakers were a compromise between sound quality, price, size, and appearance, sort of in that order of importance. I knew going in that they were going to be a compromise and I was skeptical about what I was going to be receiving. Now, my housemate that I rent from actually went out of town for about a week and I had the opportunity to use these speakers for all of my daily computer usage for an entire week. During that time, I watched, you know, YouTube and Twitch like I normally do. I also listened to music probably a little more often than I usually do, just to really try and get a feel for how I liked the speakers. And after actually using them basically full-time for a week, I have to say I actually really like these speakers. After the previous clips, I did rewire the connection between these two speakers, since you saw my initial connection was not 
tight enough because one of the wires actually fell out of the speaker. I did that again and that time I made sure not to include any of the plastic when I was tightening that ring. I made sure to grab only the metal wire itself to make sure that connection was really good between the speakers. And I don't know if it was that rewiring or if it was breaking the speakers in like Audio Engine says you have to do or if it was really just getting used to them. And part of me actually thinks that you don't actually need to break the speakers in but Audio Engine just says that as a sort of placebo thing because I've experienced it before. You know, when I got these Audio-Technica M50X headphones. These were a big adjustment from what I had had before them, and even though these are sort of my baseline that I judge everything else around today, these sounded really weird and almost a little underwhelming when I first got them. And within a couple of weeks, I was completely used to them, and I've been using them for years now, and so they become my baseline, like I said. And yeah, the speakers were really very similar. After a couple days of using them, I started to get used to the sound. At first, one of my bigger concerns with the sound was that the vocals just sounded sort of hissy, sort of foamy. They just didn't sound like what I was used to coming out of headphone monitors. But yeah, long story short, I do like the speakers. I have decided to keep them. And so you will see them in the background of my videos from now on. And with that, this was a very long video for Consumer Electronics. If you're watching at the end of the video, you probably enjoy this long form content. If you don't enjoy the long form content, you probably already turned this off and left some comment about how I talk too much. But hey, it's my natural color is no longer making videos. So somebody has to keep this up. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed coming along on my little speaker adventure with me. And with that, I'm Jacob Kaufman. I'm the nerd in the street and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.